Hey you folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to Let's Play Sid Meier's Civilization 6. That's right! Finally got my hands on a press preview version of Civ 6 that I can play at home and do a proper Let's Play with live commentary. Super excited about playing this. Now this is a pre-release version, of course. The uh, true version of uh, Civilization 6 doesn't come out uh, for another month on October 21st. As such, you know, standard disclaimers may apply. There could be uh, typos, there could be crashes, there could be major balance changes between now and when the game is released. But other than that, it is a playable game that I can play through to the end. There is no turn limit here. Very excited about that. There are only 10 of the civilizations available in this build. I think the full version has 20? Question mark, I think. Something like that, but they'll have a good number of things here. In addition to that, this press release build only has Prince difficulty and not as many options for the speed and map type and so on and so forth. But I think we're still going to have a hell of a lot of fun playing this game. Really excited to be doing it. And for me, when I start a new game of civilization, I have to go for what I consider to be one of the classic civilizations. And that mostly means, for me personally, that's Rome or Egypt, depending on, you know, if I want to build a bunch of wonders or if I want to go and conquer the world. And since Egypt is not available in this particular build here, I guess I'll have to play Rome. At the time that I'm recording this, Trajan here, <laughs> if that's even how you say his name, is the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the latest announced leader here. So it's very exciting to me to get a chance to play him. Very interesting powers. One of the things I gotta say about Civ 6 is all of the nations slash leaders, they seem to have really upped the ante on their unique abilities. Um, and I think playing as the different leaders is really gonna lead to a game that feels significantly different because it feels like all their powers are very powerful and very potent, very notable. They're all very strong, so presumably they're all going to be relatively balanced, although I'm sure we're gonna figure out that some are much stronger than others because that's just the nature of strategy games. Um, but they're all gonna be really distinctive, which has me really excited. So we're gonna be playing as Rome over here. Their unique ability is, well, they have more than one unique ability and they have a unique unit and a unique building. Unique ability number one, all roads lead to Rome. All cities you found or conquer start with a trading post. And if that trading post is in range of our capital, we start with a road to it, which is really good. And our trade routes earn plus one gold for passing through trade posts. So um, I love the road aspect of it. I think that's really potent, but also you're looking to get potentially a little bit more money, which is nice. You got the Trajan's column over here where all of our cities start with an additional city center building and the ancient era that's going to be a monument. Now, what I don't know is if this applies to cities we've conquer as well. We'll have to try to see a pay about, pay some attention to that and see if that, that kicks in. But these two things together really benefit building wide, expanding a lot with a lot of settlers, because your cities are gonna start off all a little bit stronger than the average person's city would start off, which is really exciting. We also start with the Legion, which is a unit that replaces the Swordman. From what I understand from the description, we'll have to see about checking it in game, uh, the Legion might be slightly more expensive to build than the Swordsman, but slightly more powerful and can build a fort on the road, uh, on the way. Uh, we also get the Bath, which replaces the Aqueduct, or rather is an upgrade to the Aqueduct. So. We're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna play on, yes, the one difficulty that we have an option to. We're gonna play on standard speed as opposed to quick. The, the full game should have slower speeds as well, which is exciting. I wanna play on continents, which I think is gonna be a lot of fun. You know, give us a little bit of mix of ocean and a lot of land as well, which is gonna help with our conquering. And we'll go with the standard map size, and that's gonna be fine. Let's start up the From game. The first stirrings of life beneath water. To that gorgeous voice. To the great beasts of the Stone Age. To man taking his first upright steps, you have come far. Now begins your greatest quest. From this early cradle of civilization on towards the stars. Cast your net wide, O oh Trajan. Trajan. Emperor of mighty Rome. Your legions stand at the ready to march out and establish the largest empire the world has ever seen. If you can truly get all roads to lead to Rome, yours will be an empire of great riches and luxuries. Surely then our citizens will proclaim you as their best ruler, the Optimus Princeps. That's right, we are Optimus Prime over here, ready to roll out. Uh, we are the Roman leader that expanded the borders of Rome the most. Very, very successful. I don't know, we don't really hear about Trajan very often, but he sounds like he was a pretty damn good emperor. In fact, Wikipedia references something as he being one of the five great emperors or one of the five best emperors, one of those phrases like that which, uh, I don't know, hopefully we can do him justice. So here's our, star our start, and holy cow, do we have a lot of stone. 
Double wheat, triple stone over here. Looking right away. A little cute little settler. We've got a warrior. We are on a river. It looks like we've got some tundra to the north. So most likely I will focus my early scouting efforts away from the north. I don't know about directly south. We already started on the other side of the river, so I suspect we will go west to start off with. Um, I don't see any reason not to settle in place. Perhaps as we develop greater strategies for the game, maybe we will discover that what we want to do is move on to this hills. This would have been a very interesting decision to make in uh, Civilization 5, and actually even in Civilization 4. Moving away from the river sometimes hurts, but settling on a hill is very important. In this case, I think I'm going to stay put. In particular, I know that there's some wonders slash districts that actually want to be built on a hill. We don't have very many of them. So I'm going to settle in place for our very first game. I think that's going to be fine. We can see our key, our, our, uh, our actions over here. Most of these are hotkeyed as well. In fact, oh, we'll probably get some text here. Okay, no, no text yet. In fact, if we go into the options, we see, and I'm pretty sure this is the first time in a civilization game we've had the ability to change our keybinds, which I'm incredibly excited for. I think that is fantastic. Really excited for that. I will complain that to me there is missing one keybind in here. Um, and uh, well, well, we'll deal with that a little bit later, but it's basically a keybind for the unit to wait. To wait, not, not sleep for a turn, not do nothing, but to wait and just cycle through the list of available units to use. And as far as I can tell, there's not really a button or a keybind for that. And that makes me a little bit sad. It's one of those features that actually has become invisible. People, I don't think, realize that was a feature in there. And in fact, I don't even know if the people over at Firaxis were really aware that it was still a feature. It was in Civ Five, but kind of invisible. Uh, the W hotkey, by default, was the way to cycle between units. But there, I think there was still, a, I think there was still a button for it in Civ Five. But in Beyond Earth, there definitely was no button for it. The W key still allowed you to cycle through units, which is great up until the point where you developed a certain technology. At which point, using the W key on a worker would actually cause them to build a workshop, I believe, which was, uh, which made me a little bit sad. Maybe I'm like the only person in the universe who used that hotkey, but man, oh man, did I love it. As a result, you'll probably see this happen a lot, the great work screen pop open, because that's the W key. Anyway, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and start moving our warrior here. One thing you'll note as I move, say, just one tile over here, I no longer have the ability to climb up onto the hill. One of the massive, tiny changes that will have massive effects in Civ 6 is the fact that you need to have your full, you need two moves to get on top of the hill. And unlike in Civ 5, where if I had one move left, I could still go onto a hill, in Civ 6, you cannot. This is a throwback to Civ 2, Civ 3. There was definitely a previous version of Civ that was like this. Between this and also the fact that promotions end your turn, if you use up your promotion, um, you can save the promotion, you don't have to use them right away, but if you use a promotion, it ends your turn on that unit. Between the two of them, this is going to slow down combat and prevent you from being able to sort of like snowball and blitzkrieg your way through an area the same way, which I think is going to be really interesting. Map, of course, extraordinarily gorgeous, just brilliant. By the way, the uh, this first game is going to be a little bit slower as we do more reading and just more talking about the game around us. We're not here to rush through a win or anything of the sort. We're here to in experience the game the first time and finally getting a chance to read tooltips a little bit more. Up until now, even for me doing the um, the previews, uh, I wasn't really able to show and linger on the tooltips because of course they're like, well, the numbers are going to change as we go forward. So we've got some mercury over here, which looks like it produces science, which is very exciting. And we've got some sheepies over here, which presumably are... Um, this is a hill, so I'm assuming the hill by itself is producing two production, and the sheep are probably producing the two food. If you look at this hill over here... Oh no, Plains Hills gets one food, two production. Okay, so the sheep is just adding one, um, one food. The mercury is probably just adding one science, although improved, perhaps it will get better. All right, that's good. We do have to choose our production in Rome over here. And here's one of the big things that it'll be interesting to see how it goes. In previous versions of Civ, including, say, Civ 5, the strategies for the opening moves have, have evolved a little bit over the years since release. In particular, as different expansions and different balance patches happen. Um, at the current stage in Civ 5, most people agree that uh, a very strong opening move is to go scout scout monument uh, unless you're on maybe like tiny island kind of map because the scouts really help you find a lot of goody huts they help you meet more civilizations which actually give you discounts on research um and they help you scout out your early cities a lot more uh whereas back in the day a monument first tended to be really appealing and for some people it's more like scout scout maybe like shrine or rather 
um, shrine replacement, like if you're playing as the Maya. But in Civ 6, who knows? Now, it's worth noting, I can't build any buildings to start off with. Um, I do, let's see, where do I get the city list from? So I've got this uh, city um, detail screen, which is awesome. I love the breakdown over here. I think this looks great. There's our list of buildings. So, a trading post. Yeah, okay, so we did get that. Excellent. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and build a scout. I don't think we need to rush a builder right away. I believe the builder would be able to uh, to improve the wheat, but until we get mining, we can't improve the stone anyway, although we might start with mining quite early. Uh, I do think I want a scout so that I can get a little bit more information. It might only be the one. Let's go ahead and take a look at our research tree over here. Now, for those of you who don't know, the effectively research has sort of been split into two areas because there's the actual technology screen here. And for the very first time, I can show you the late game text that was that was forbidden in uh, the previous uh, previews that I could do. Um, we're not really going to spend too much time spending or paying attention to them right now since they're so far in the future. What are we going to do with them? But the technology tree is basically half the technology. The other half is the civics tree over here, which has, I think, just as many things as the technology tree. Maybe, maybe more, or sorry, maybe maybe a little less, I'm not sure. Um, and this also unlocks some buildings and some wonders, but also a lot of our laws. We do have to start with the code of laws, so obviously we're gonna go there. So for our research, I think, given our start, we're probably gonna wanna pick up mining early just because of the stuff that's around. I but. I don't know what the correct strategy is going to be here. Maybe exclusively to what's around, we want to rush up to writing. I mean, it does get us the granary along the way. It's only plus one food, more housing, which is your the cap of your city size, which is to me a throwback to older versions of Civ, um, like Civ 4, for example. Uh, you could only grow your cities to, I want to say size seven until you build an aqueduct. Here it's a little bit fuzzier because cities can spawn with a different amount of housing. Our capital does have a housing capacity of six. So six is our max pop. If we built the granary, then uh, eight would be our maximum population in our capital. Plus one food would help us grow. So I mean, that's good and fine. And certainly uh, getting to the campus earlier would be nice. One question is how good of a campus location do we have? And the answer is, ugh, we don't. It's frustrating. This is like my uh, my England preview, if you saw that. I complained about the fact that I had no good place to plop down a campus at all in my first city. And I was sitting right next to a Roomba who was playing as Brazil, which started next to Jungle and has like uh, was able to turbo campus, put a campus that gave like five freaking science per turn. And look, up, like, and we don't give them much science at the start. So that, wow. Hmm. Science is going to hurt. Now, the, the campus will give us something, especially if we upgrade it to a library, but I don't think rushing to it makes sense in this particular context. You can see the, um, um, it does give us, okay, the campus does give us science per citizen, that's true. We just aren't going to get advantage of any of the adjacency, because despite what the list looks like, it's mostly you get bonus science for being adjacent to a mountain, bonus science for being adjacent to two rainforest tiles or adjacent to two other districts not one which was in the previous build so it's quite hard to get any adjacency bonuses with the campus unless you're near some mountains um, but we do i guess get the plus two science per citizen which is quite notable still i think i'm going to start with mining uh because the production boost will be quite huge and we will go probably for a builder after our scout and then after that i'm pretty sure we will indeed go for so mining into writing like that uh just like in previous versions of sips you can hold shift down to queue these up so that's going to be okay uh we don't have enough money to do anything right now we can manage our citizens over here if we want to uh by hitting this button we can lock people things in fact i think i'm going to lock rome to the triple food marsh over here Dude, does it make sense that marshes generate extra food? I wonder what it would be. It's like full of okra or cranberries. I mean, you grow cranberries. No, you don't grow them in big pools of water. You see them in water because that's how you harvest them. Rice, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, so I want Rome to grow a little bit faster. Can we get stats as to when it will grow? Five turns until growth. Um, seven turns until growth. Yeah, I think faster growth is probably way more important. So we're going to go ahead and prioritize that. As far as I can tell, there's... Oh, no, that's not true. So let me go, I'm no longer managing the citizens, but I can tell them to focus, there we go, on food, like that. Now I wonder, like in previous versions of Civ, if what you actually want to do is lock to production focus, but then lock that. In Civ 5, that was a trick you could do to just squeeze out one extra production from time to time. No idea if it still works, I don't know what the timing of the process is, but I bet you it's probably pretty similar. So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, 
and do that. So we've got the extra food, we'll grow a little faster. It's going to delay our scout, but that's fine. Next turn. Mm, lovely bird sounds. Hopefully you guys can hear it okay. So I'm going to keep scouting this way for speed. Ah, nice mountains over here for potentially a really, really good campus location. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to move west and then around the mountain. Because I want to clear up this area as well. But I'm going to go and do that. Then we can pop onto the uh, the hill afterwards. Maybe go into this hill. Is this another hill? Yeah, so it's going to be a bit slow moving. This may even bottleneck us, but... God, it looks gorgeous. we got some copper down there. Excellent. We've got Mercury Byrome itself, which is great. No goody huts yet. Um, I guess what I'll do is I will go and pop here. So we'll reveal a little bit more to the north before we come down. We've got some diamonds over here. Okay, that's very good. And yeah, a campus here would be quite nice. You can only build one copy of each district per city. So we were just looking for a place to put down one ideal campus, which may be here. This would be adjacent to what looks like three mountains to me. Um, and that would be a pretty high amount of science from that one campus. Again, the campus science does seem to grow with population now. I don't know if it did in the earlier builds. Oh, and we've met the King of Spain, Portugal, Sardinia, and Sicily, Naples, Duke of Milan, etc. He's pretty full of himself. Um, but we've got Philip. Philip? I think it's Philip over here. Who does imply something about religion most of the way. Yeah, the follower of the one true religion. Not that anyone's found any religions yet, but he's pretty excited about it. We're going to be nice for now. It is an honor to meet you. Hello, Phil. How's it going? Of course, we would love to sample your hospitality. And we have met a civilization, therefore we've gotten our first Eureka. Every technology and, as far as I know, code of law in the game does have a Eureka or inspiration. I think the code, the, um... Uh, the, the civics tree, they call them inspirations, but they're basically the same. There's something that you can fulfill which will give you half of a tech. So all of a sudden our writing research time has been cut in half, which is pretty massive. Um, we should actually try to pay a little of attention to that. We've got our mining over here, which has, okay, has no Eureka. I guess the first three don't have any Eurekas, which means we don't actually have to worry about getting the one for pottery, for example. But now that getting that discount for writing is very nice because that was our plan already. Now, of course, that Eureka is going to be pretty easy to get every game. Some are going to be a little easier, some are going to be a little harder. Uh, astrology, in my little test game, I was not able to find a natural wonder before I completed astrology on my own, which is a little bit sad. Sailing, it's so appropriate. Sailing to boost found a city on the coast makes perfect sense. All right, so Madrid is over here, which actually puts a massive crimp in my plans to get the the sort of um, campus city on the western side of the mountains. In any case, there's our some stone over there, which would be a little bit of conflict. Hey, our, our city grows. People thrive, and our population grows. Tell me more. Ah, we'll open the Civilopedia for the first time. So yes, your city grows, or add more citizens, surplus food, food, blah, 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 blah. Excellent. Looks great. I do love the look of the uh, Civilopedia. I think it, it looks gorgeous. I mean, it's effectively the same as the one in Civ 5, but the style is nice. I like the color. I like the font. Um, so we're definitely going to want to head back east over here to check out Rome. This is still going to be a fine place for a campus. I mean, we may not work out the same adjacency bonuses, but it's going to be fine. In Civ 5, I would be crossing the river here to go up on this hill, but you can see that I can't do that right now, so I may as well use an extra move. And I've discovered an extra continent. Okay, so this is something interesting that I noticed when I was just running a tiny little test game over here, is that um, continents... Well, first of all, you may have noticed in the mouse over that it tells you what continent you're pointing out. Here is the continent of Laurasia, which is where we started. And somewhere over here, there is another continent, maybe on the other side of the river here. Indeed, Pangea Ultima. There is a lens mode over here that will highlight continents for you. So in this case, even though it's the same contiguous piece of land, you can still have multiple continents there, which is important actually, because there are some civilizations, like for example, England, that gets a pretty massive bonus when it settles cities on a new continent and if you're playing on Pangea which is one big super continent you might be like well I'm not gonna get that bonus but they do break down big land masses into multiple continents you can think of it a bit as Europe and Asia uh, North and South America for example which is I think for game balance is great and also makes a fair deal of sense <sighs> and of course since I'm over here we're gonna run into a barbarian scout that reaches Rome from the eastern side, which means it's going to discover the city and then run back to his barbarian encampment and start spamming out a billion barbarians. Enacting new policies in our government can be of great benefit. Our people await your decree. Excellent. Best. 
Man is the noblest of all animals. Separated from law and justice, he is the worst. I mean, I don't think anyone will ever be, be truly better than having freaking Spock read out the science quotes, but man, oh man, does Sean Bean have a great voice for this. Adds just a lot of authority and drama, I think, to the tech quotes, or in this case, the, uh, the, the laws quotes. So we get to modify our government for the very first time here. Uh, we are currently a chieftain government, which means that we have the ability to choose one military policy and one economic policy. There is um, Greece. Greece always has a bonus wildcard policy, regardless of their government type, which is quite nice. Got a little exclamation mark here for highlighting the new traits. Um, I do quite like survey, and that's going to be important, but I think very first thing we're going to do is we are going to grab discipline for combat bonus when fighting barbarians, because apparently that's going to be important. Uh, I really love urban planning a lot, um, but since we only have one city right now, I'm wondering about going God King, seeing if we can't sneak in an early pantheon, which would be nice. Since this is only a bonus in the capital, but when we get more cities, urban planning will be good. So that's what I'm going to try to do, because we're generating no faith right now. By taking this, hopefully we can get a pantheon, and I think that's going to be useful. We can change that pretty frequently. So I'm going to start heading back east with my warrior over here. Hey, it's Toronto! City -state. Establishing diplomatic relations with them will surely be beneficial for our empire. Perhaps we should send them an envoy. So... There are several different types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our city... Shush. Okay. So city-states are back. They do work considerably different than in Civ V. The biggest way that you get influence with them is by sending them envoys. And one of the important reasons that you would start with an early scout is the fact that the first civilization to meet a city-state gets a free envoy with them. And in particular, we have gotten the one with Toronto over here. I think it said it in the sidebar here. This is, we met the city-state. We got a quest, construct a campus. Mm -hmm. There we go, city-state meaning bonus. As the first major civilization to meet the Toronto city-state, you've earned one envoy there. Very, very powerful. As a result of having an envoy, we get the first level. You only need one envoy to get the first level, plus two production in the capital when building wonders, buildings, and districts. Huge, absolutely massive. Um, that's because Toronto is an industrial city-state over here, so we get that. Some give you faith, some give you science, etc. So that's gonna be wonderful. Um, and it'll be even more powerful. We can send more envoys over there. So we do get to choose our next civic that we want to go up through. Um, the start of the tree is pretty tight here. We can unlock some new policies. I don't care about the naval units. Probably we'll go craftsmanship. Bonus to producing melee and ranged units is handy, plus workers or builders, not workers anymore. We're going to do that. But what we're interested in is we're interested in working, up, working our way up to political philosophy, which we're going to go through there. Then we're going to get the early empire and state workforce and then get this to unlock the first true sets of governments, which really open up a lot more options. Although military decision is going to be quite nice, but we could wait until we get the boost. We're not, I don't think we're going to get the boost on craftsmanship because improve three tiles. We did, okay, hold on. We did discover the second continent, though, which cuts this in half. Um, these policies are a little bit stronger, but this would minimize our time to get the political philosophy. Which I like. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. I mean, I think one way or another we'll get the discount on one of these. If we get really lucky, we might be able to get the discount on both. Oh, oh have I been reading this wrong? Oh, I'm going to have to get both down here regardless. Okay, I didn't realize that these... So these two chain. So no matter what, I have to get these two. I'll start with the foreign trade side then. It'll complete sooner. And we do unlock the ability to build trader units, which sounds pretty handy. And then maybe we'll get the triple improvement in time for the other one, but probably not. Alright. Now you over here... Oh, you can set multiple... Multiple preferences. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So yeah, then you started working that. And I'll lock this. I probably shouldn't micromanage this as, as much as I am here. But we'll have to see. I've got to be a little bit more on the ball for when uh, Rome grows here. It's weird. They, the escape menu brings up the menu first Just rather than zooming out. Our citizens have faith in your leadership. So they are beginning to have faith in a higher power. I think it is wise to cultivate this new way of thinking. Perhaps there is some benefit to be gained. Yes, absolutely. We are indeed generating faith now, thanks to our new policy. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to move 
east here, and even though I still have a move left, I cannot actually enter the marsh here, because it takes two moves to do that. There is less of a penalty for moving through a city tile in Civ 6 than Civ 5, because you can't lose relationship from upsetting the city-state by walking through them. And we do have to see if we can create the contest. units like scouts are Campus. unique in that they can gain experience by exploring and discovering parts of the world. Who deserves more credit than the wife of a coal miner? Okay, we'll get back to your research. So yeah, the scouts in this version are interesting. They don't start off with any ability to ignore rough terrain. They do start with a movement rate of three, however, as opposed to two. So they do walk around a lot easier. And they do get experience points simply for discovering things. Uh, I do ultimately want to move east over here, or perhaps south. Well, my warrior is going to discover the south. So I will mostly move east. But I'm going to go north first and then sort of swoop down a little bit. So I'm going to move a little bit, one tile at a time, so I can sort of spot things as I go here. Our explorers yeah, that is... have spotted another friendly <gasps> tribal A goody hut. I suggest we send a scout to investigate. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be an actual scout unit, as far as I can tell, just flavored that way. But yes, we are absolutely going to prioritize getting to that goody hut, because we hadn't found one yet. Okay, this is still a good place for a campus right over here, although there's going to be a good chance of overlap at the city-state. Um, I wouldn't want to settle too close. But, like, I could settle, say, here, and then quickly buy the tiles and drop the campus there. Here would also be fine, because it'd be adjacent to two mountains. Although, I'm not sure if a... where do you get? Um, Holy Site District. Okay, also gets the adjacency from mountains. So, really what we want to do is we want to cram the two districts right in there. And that's going to be a little tricky to do, but we'll see. Um... We could start working on a settler right away. And as far as I can tell, things are a little bit different balance-wise. In Civ 5, I would absolutely wait until size 4 every time before building a settler. I think I will still do that here because it will... Um, I don't know if it halts the city growth, but it does reduce the population by 1 when it's complete. The question is, do you build a settler right away or do you go with a builder? I feel like I want to get a builder first. Get our city to grow a little bit bigger before I start putting out settlers, but... We may be surprised. We may find out that the right way to build our first settler is indeed size 2. But for now, that's going to be fine. Anyway, and that brings us to the end of the very first episode here. We've got a very nearby neighbor. Spain may be our first target, or who knows, maybe a lifelong friend. Uh, there's a great city location over here that I would love to snag, although there's the heavy risk of overlap with the city-state. We'll see how that goes. Um... You know, maybe that's incentive to get out the settler a little faster. Maybe I'll just wait three turns for the next population growth and then switch over to the settler growth. That's entirely possible as well. On the other hand, the sooner you get out builders and improve your territory, the sooner your city locations start to get stronger. Um, if I just said, don't focus on anything in specific. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I'm just going to keep the uh, the food focus on there and not mess around with it too much. All right, I'm happy with that. Anyway, thank you very much for watching the first episode of this Let's Play. As always, with the first episode of a series, I will ask that if you can, you know, like, share, favorite, comment, do all that. It really makes a huge difference. And I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.